My name is Kyle Banker and I work for Tengen. Uh, Tengen is uh, obviously the company that uh, maintains and sponsors the, um, the continuing development of MongoDB. Um, if you ever need to email me, I'm Kyle at Tengen.com and I'm at Huat on Twitter. And this is a presentation about optimizing MongoDB. Um, I think that you know the first thing whenever we uh, get questions from customers or users about MongoDB and the first thing we want to look at are their indexes and so this is mainly a presentation on indexing in MongoDB, how MongoDB's uh, indexes work, uh, how you can use them, uh, how you can use them to optimize your, your queries and how you can uh, profile them. So let's take a look um, just at kind of the agenda uh, what I'm going to cover. I'm going to talk a little bit about indexing in general and uh, some of the general kinds of problems and questions that we see in the wild. Uh, I'll talk about managing indexes in Mongo, how to create them, how to delete them, how to look at their size, etc. Uh, we'll look at some example queries, uh, the types of queries that match um, the kinds of indexes you might be building. We'll talk about how MongoDB's query optimizer works. Um, we'll also look at how to profile and explain uh, queries so that you can optimize individual queries. I'm also going to try to intermix a few live demos. Um, I have a little sample data set of tweets, which we all know and understand. Um, and so we'll look at that and uh, we'll build some indexes there and kind of look at how to explain uh, our queries uh, on those indexes. And there should be more than enough time for questions. So I, I tend to think that the questions part uh, can be very interesting. So uh, please definitely, if you have any sort of question, um, like Catherine said, do preface it with a queue and post it in the chat room, and I'll be happy to uh, to answer any of those at the end of the presentation. So um, there is some trouble with indexing. Um, it's actually widely misunderstood. Even people who are um, who are used to using indexing in other types of databases, particularly relational databases, um, we, we find sometimes have a lot of trouble when when doing indexing in Mongo, and, it, and it's just a really important thing. You know, as with Relational systems, um, indexing and schema design go hand in hand, and, and you sort of need to start thinking about these things uh, right from the get-go. And hopefully we can kind of learn, you know, what's important, what you need to be thinking about um, during this presentation. Um, one of the things that I've, that I've found, that I've discovered, uh, is that a lot of users don't have a good mental model of indexing, and, and that may not apply to people in this uh, particular uh, uh, webcast, but if, if you feel like if a little, um, like, like you need some sort of review or, or that your mental model is, is somewhat lacking, I, I put together a blog post on my blog. It's called The Joy of Indexing, and I, I highly recommend having a look at it, um, especially if, for instance, compound indexes are a problem. So let's look at some of the anti-patterns uh, when it comes to indexing. You know, when, when people come to us and they say, hey, my, my Mongo application isn't performing well, we say, well, you know, we ask them about their indexes. And sometimes they say, well, we don't have any indexes. And obviously that's a, that's a very obvious problem. But then we also get the opposite uh, side of the spectrum where somebody says, well, we've indexed everything. And that can also be a problem um, if you understand the way indexes work. Another thing we see are unused indexes, redundant indexes, uh, failure to consider compound indexes, and kind of going along with that, a poor understanding of how compound indexes actually work. So hopefully we can clear up um, some of these types of misunderstandings today. But these are the things to keep in mind as I'm talking about um, indexing in MongoDB. I guess I guess one of the things I want to talk about real quick or just point out among this list here, uh, the topic of unused indexes. Um, you know, in, in a database like MongoDB where, you, where it's so easy to declare indexes, it's obviously easy to have built too many indexes or indexes that you won't actually be using. Um, indexes should really be built on the basis of profiling. And again, we'll look at that uh, in just a few minutes. So some of the generalities for indexing in MongoDB. MongoDB uses uh, B-Tree data structure for indexes. Uh, this is very common. B-Trees have been used for probably over 30 years now. Uh, B-Trees are used in most relational databases. And the nice thing about that is that if you're coming from a relational database and you're, you're coming to MongoDB and you have some sense of how indexes work and how to optimize for indexes in a relational database, then you can really transfer a lot of those principles to your use of MongoDB. Um, you know, one of the most obvious kind of implications of using B-trees, B-trees are very good for lookups um, and they're very good for range scans and uh, a number of other applications, but they do entail additional work on inserts, updates, and deletes. And, you know, this should be obvious, but for each index that you add to a particular collection, every time you write to that collection, whether you insert, update, or delete, you have to modify each of the indexes on that collection. Um, 
and that that can entail a lot of extra a lot of extra work. So we always need to keep that in mind. Um, a collection, MongoDB collections, uh, can have up to 64 indexes. If you need more than 64 indexes in a given collection, you're probably doing it wrong. Um, I, I, I haven't seen any exceptions to that rule. Uh, query may use only one index. This is also another misconception that I've seen numerous times. People will build um, multiple indexes or more than one index on, you know, on different keys and query on both of those keys and assume that that query can use both indexes. But that is almost never the case, um, except as you see on the slide here for disjuncts or queries involving the dollar sign or operator. Um, in those cases, you can use multiple indexes, although um, you, you may want to find a different way to express the query. If you can find a way to express the query where it'll use just one index, you could probably get a more optimized query. So let's talk about creating indexes. Creating indexes in MongoDB is really easy, actually. Uh, you simply use this ensure index method if you're uh, working from the shell. One thing to keep in mind uh, is that for any collection that you create, the underscore ID attribute will always be indexed. So that's essentially like having a default index on the primary key for a given collection. Now, there's one exception to that rule, which is with caps collections, uh, which are special pre-allocated collections um, designed to maintain insertion order. These uh, collections do not have the index underscore ID. You generally don't uh, index these collections because you generally iterate over them, over them uh, in natural order. Um, but for most collections, for the vast majority of collections, and that is standard collections, the underscore ID attribute will automatically be indexed. To create additional indexes, you simply use this ensure index method. And you can see in our first example here, uh, I go db.users.insureindex username one, um, the way I define the index is by using a document. Um, so it's essentially a document representation that helps us define our indexes. And in this case, we're uh, building a very simple index on username, which is, would be a common lookup. Let's create a compound index. Um, it's not much more difficult. Uh, imagining we had a posts collection, we might want to create an index on user ID and the creation date. And one of the things you'll notice in this case is that User ID has a value of one and created it has a value of negative one. And what that means, one means ascending, uh, negative one means descending. And uh, this is obviously a very common kind of pattern for a compound index where you'd have the user ID ascending and the created at descending so that you could, for instance, uh, sort by the most recent uh, posts that a given user had created. Uh, a couple other examples of creating indexes in Mongo. Um, and we'll talk more about this in a second, but one of the things I wanted to mention is that you, you really don't have to have knowledge of the field. Um, MongoDB will index um, the field no matter what type it contains, uh, including an array. And MongoDB indexes arrays um, in a kind of interesting way. Uh, if you can imagine we have a sample document, you can see I have uh, in the comment there, sample doc, and it has a key called favorites, which points to an array containing three strings, red, blue, and green. And when I call uh, db.users.insureindex on that favorites key, uh, what Mongo is going to do when it encounters that document is it's actually going to create a separate entry in the index for each uh, value within the array. And what that means is that when you go to query, when I say, like, I want to find all the documents that have a favorites containing the string red, um, that will be a very standard B-tree lookup, um, and it'll, it'll point to that particular document. I'll talk a little bit more about indexing on arrays um, a little bit later, but that's, that's a really, really valuable uh, feature of MongoDB, and it's used quite frequently. Um, uh, a couple other indexing options. We can create unique indexes, so db.users.insureindex on the username. Um, username is probably one of those attributes that we'd want a uniqueness constraint on, um, and so we just passed a second sort of options document specifying that we want that to be unique. And in the next case, uh, we, create an, we can create indexes in the background, too. So by default, um, indexes will build in the foreground, which means that they will block. Um, and if you've ever indexed uh, really large tables or large collections in MongoDB, you know that this can take a lot of time. And if you're actually using the database at the time, it um, can be a problem. And so if you need to create a, an index uh, in a, on, for instance, a production database that already has a lot of data in it, you may want to specify background as true. Uh, do keep in mind though that, that will, there will be a performance hit on the server while that index is being created, so do be careful about that. Um, 
index maintenance, uh, just to, uh, we, we drop indexes. We speci simply specify the uh, index definition, the document that specifies the index. We can drop all indexes very easily. Um, there's also a facility for rebuilding indexes. This shouldn't be necessary uh, for most people for most situations. Um, but th there have been cases when, um, where in earlier versions of Mongo or in, in production deployments with huge amounts of data, when um, a lot of deletes can take place and where essentially the space for the index isn't necessarily being reused as efficiently as we want it to be, um, we've sometimes encouraged users to re-index um, particular index so that it's uh, nice and compact and doesn't take up as much space. Um, that, that, again, going forward, that should be less and less necessary as, uh, as the indexing uh, data structures and um, storage kind of reusal uh, improves. So I guess one of the things that I want to just show you really quickly, we, we just talked about kind of how to maintain indexes, how to build indexes. And one of the things I can uh, demonstrate right now is just uh, the building of an index. And so what I have here is, um, like I said, I have a collection of tweets. So we're using the Twitter database. Um, if I show collections, I can see that I have a few collections. Um, the most important of these is tweets. And um, we can see kind of what uh, the tweets collection looks like. I'll do a find one to kind of get a look at a particular uh, tweet document. Um, so you'll notice it has kind of a rich document structure. Um, we have this user um, key which points to an inner object which contains a lot of different attributes about um, our user here. One of the things that we might want to query on is the friends count. And so we can easily uh, build out an index on that field. And this is something that I didn't show in the slides just now. But you can actually reach into an object. And the way we would reference user friends count is with a dot. So we would say ensure index on user dot friends count. So let me show you how I do that. I'd say db dot tweets dot ensure index. And then I'd use a document here and I'd say user dot friends count one. And hit enter. And it may take a few seconds to build the index because it's about 85 megabytes of data. Um, if I check in the stats, uh, we can see the indexes that have been built on this particular collection right now. You can see the index sizes as well, but the two indexes that exist are underscore ID and user.friendscount, and you can see their respective sizes. Another way to look at indexes, and this is kind of a little bit of an insider thing, but I'll just show you kind of how this works. There's actually a special system collection called system.indexes, and if you query that collection, you can actually see uh, the definitions for the indexes that are defined on this collection. Um, and in fact, this is, this is a special collection and it works in this way. When you add entries to the collection, that's tantamount to adding an index to the collection. And removing the entries from the collection is also tantamount to removing the index. So anything in this, in this collection essentially defines the indexes for that collection. Um, now I showed you in the slides a couple minutes ago some sort of helper functions that you can use rather than directly modifying that collection. But just in case you, you wanted to know. Um, one other thing, let's do one, one other uh, operation here and build out a simple compound index. Um, kind of like we did earlier on the post document, we, we might want to build a compound index on user.screen uh, name and user.created app so we could sort a user's tweets. Um, and so we would do db.tweets.ensure index. And again, we use that dot notation to reach into the object. User dot screen name and user dot oops, created at, and we make created at descending. And then we, go, we can just check our stats to make sure that the index was actually created. And you can see that it's been created at the bottom and that it's about four megabytes in size. Um, we'll come back to kind of looking at queries on those particular indexes, but let's go back to the presentation and talk a little bit more about how indexes work in Mongo. So um, one, one thing to sort of keep in mind is that indexes are smart about data types and structures. And you know that MongoDB is, uh, does not enforce constraints on the types you store in a particular field. So for instance, if you had a field, let's just say you had a field called username, you generally have strings representing usernames um, in there. But suppose for some aberrant reason, you actually had an integer stored in that field. Um, that's perfectly permissible 
and uh, the value will be indexed. But when you query, um, only, only results of the type you query with will be returned. So if you query using a string, you're only going to get results back that are strings. If you query using on a field um, using an integer, you're only going to get integer results back. Okay, so this is um, you know, a very obvious question: When can indexes be used? Used, and in short, you can really you know anytime you envision an index being used, uh, it will be used, and that, that's not very helpful for people who haven't really learned a lot about indexes, and so I don't, I don't find that to be very good advice for a lot, but let's just give some very concrete examples. Um, imagine we have a user's collection, um, and we store their, the user's age, and we index on it. So the first query, um, finding a user with a given age, you will use an index. The second query, finding a user with an age in some set of values, and one, two, and three is the greatest example here, but we can imagine age in 25, 26, 27, 28. Um, the next query is a range query. It says, find me all the users with age greater than one. That will also use the, an index on age. Um, doing a count query, counts actually use a, walk the index. So if we want to find all the users whose age is two, uh, we can issue that count query and that will walk the index. Uh, MongoDB has a distinct function, finding all the distinct users with an age of two. That will also use an index. And um, also sorting, you know, uh, indexes are, are, are commonly used for sorts. We have an index on age. We want to sort by from oldest to youngest, and the last query on the page here will do that for us, and it will also use an index. Um, there are some, obviously, some trickier cases in which indexes can be used. Um, the query here, db.post.find, where user ID is 123.sort, created at, descending. Uh, we'll use an index on created at for sorting. Um, even if there's no index on user ID, or if there's no index, index on user ID. Um, in this case, we actually want to use a compound index, um, which, I'll, which I'll show in just a moment, but um, we don't necessarily need that. One thing that may trip you up a little bit is the syntax um, that we use in the shell there. When I say post.finds.sort, um, to, to some eyes, and this is very natural, to some eyes that indicates that the dot .sort is somehow a separate operation, but in fact, the conditions in the find and the sort are all executed as a single query on the server. So do keep that in mind when you see statements that look like that. Um, when we do an update, um, in this case, uh, every update, of course, has some query portion, selects the document that we want to update. Uh, so when we update uh, the user ID with, um, or the user with the user ID of uh, one, two, three, uh, that will use an index on user ID. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention, I, I kind of alluded to this a second ago when I was building the index on the Twitter collection, but uh, we can index on inner attributes, and there's sort of a variety of ways that MongoDB can do that. Um, so let's, let's look at this sort of sample document. Um, don't worry about the semantics of it too much, but the first key says coordinate, and it points to a single document with two values, X and Y. Um, the next key is addresses, and that points to an array of documents. Um, each of those documents has a city and a zip code attribute. So let me show you a couple of the ways you could index this document. Um, the first example at the bottom, I build an index, I build a compound index on the inner values of the coordinates, so coordinate.x and coordinate.y. And that would be incredibly useful um, for, for indexing, uh, or for queries on those two fields, or for qu queries just on coordinate.x. Remember that uh, compound indexes are ordered and um, the order matters in determining whether a given query will work with the compound index or not. I'll talk more about that in a second. The second way we can build a, um, an index here is on the entire object. So in other words, I'm, I'm saying build an index just on coordinate. And what that does is that actually indexes the whole object, X and Y. So the only way to use, um, the only way to query and use that particular index is to, is to specify the entire object with the keys in order. So that'll essentially uh, index the binary representation of that object. And that can be useful for certain types of use cases. Um, finally, um, we can also index on objects within an array. So if I wanted to index on zip code right here, I can do ensure index on addresses.zip. And that, that allows me to say, find all the documents here where the addresses where the addresses contains the zip code 10010. So MongoDB is smart about 
indexing on all these different types. So you really don't have to um, tell MongoDB what type is going to be located in the given field in advance. So a couple of array examples. Uh, I showed you an example of indexing on arrays before. Um, in this case, we have uh, an index on where our colors are. Let's say a tag attribute is green, blue, and red. So, you know, we can do a very standard query. We're finding all the posts where the tags contain the string green. Uh, we can do a range query. Um, this would be a, this is a little bit arcane in this example, but we could say find me all the posts where the tag uh, has some string that matches greater than or equal to the string green. But we can do all, we can use the all operator, which say find me uh, all the posts that have all of these tags, green and blue. Um, and we can also, also use uh, an in query, dollar sign in, saying find all the posts with either red or black, essentially. So it's, it's kind of a way of doing an or query. Uh, but all these queries will work uh, both on obviously standard attributes and also on array, indexed array attributes. So it's very important to keep in mind uh, the situations when indexes cannot be used in MongoDB. Um, first of all, uh, with negations, uh, it's very difficult to walk an index and match against a not equals. So if you're using the NE operator or the not operator, those won't use indexes. If, if an operator does some sort of computation, um, that also isn't going to work. We have a mod operator, which allows you to say, you know, find everything where mod two is zero. Um, that's definitely not going to work with an index. Um, you can query with regular expressions using MongoDB. So you can say, find everything that contains the letter A, which that first regular expression would do for you. Um, that won't work with an index, but if you're doing a prefix query, it will work. Um, now that, uh, the B didn't come out correctly, but what I meant to indicate by that regular expression is everything that starts with B. And if you do any sort of prefix query, that will use an index. That's sort of analogous to a relational database. If you're using like, a like clause, um, you can generally uh, utilize an index if you say something is like such and such followed by a percent sign. It's sort of the equivalent. Uh, MongoDB also allows you to uh, specify a dollar sign where clauses, which essentially evaluate JavaScript for each document. Obviously, if we're evaluating JavaScript over a document, there's no way to utilize an index there. Um, where clauses are, and JavaScript clauses in general in MongoDB are good, for, are good to narrow down um, queries that already have other standard MongoDB query operators in them. So if you, if for instance you, you've already you've already matched against a subset of the documents in a collection, then the where clause can narrow that down a little bit more um, in a way that might not be provided by the standard MongoDB query language. But in general, be very careful with using JavaScript and queries in MongoDB because again, they don't use indexes. Um, MapReduce um, also because it relies on JavaScript cannot take advantage of indexes. Um, however, one thing that you can do with MapReduce, it's good to keep in mind, is that you can pass a query filter. Uh, to any MapReduce job that will filter the result or filter uh, against the collection that you're running the MapReduce on. Uh, this allows you to reduce the number of documents that run over the MapReduce um, because another way you could conceivably do this is, re is reduce the documents within the map function. That would of course be significantly less performant. So better to use a query filter if you are going to be using MapReduce and you don't need to MapReduce over the entire collection. So it's incredibly important to keep in mind that compound indexes help a lot and are, are essential for a lot of different types of queries. Um, like I said earlier in the, in the webcast, we've seen a lot of users who have a lot of indexes on single keys. They're querying on multiple keys and they assume that those indexes can be used in, uh, together. But as we, as we said before, um, generally speaking, queries can only use a single index. Therefore, if you're gonna query on multiple keys, you need to use a compound index. Let's look at some examples of these. Um, obviously, another thing to be careful about is um, redundant indexes before I look at the examples. Um, if you have an index on user ID and votes, this is ordered, you don't need an index on user ID by itself because the querying on user ID by itself will use the compound index on user ID and votes. Of course, if you're going to query just on votes, it's probably a good idea to have an index on votes as well if you have a compound index on user ID and votes. Um, again, the compound order matters. Uh, a com an index on user ID votes is not the same as an index on votes user ID. Again, if this isn't obvious, definitely, I definitely recommend reading up a little bit on indexing in general. Um, the article that I mentioned earlier 
uh, in the webcast uh, can help out in this way. Uh, another thing, uh, let's talk about matching on compound indexes because this is pretty important. So imagine you have an index on user ID, votes, and created app. This allows you to query on user ID, on user ID votes, and on user ID, votes, and created at. Uh, in other words, you have to start from the left and continue adding keys. You cannot start from the right so easily. Um, if you have any sort of range query inside of your, um, and you're trying to use a compound index, the range portion of the the range portion of the query has to come last. So for instance, we could query on user ID is one with votes greater than one. Um, in that case, the second key in our query is specifying a range query. But something that won't work is querying with user ID greater than one and votes greater than one. Um, in that case, the range query isn't coming last. Um, and that is a requirement for using these compound indexes. There are a few exceptions to some of these generic rules for compound indexing. Um, there are a few tweaks that would allow you to, to for instance, uh, skip the middle key in a triple compound index, um, and MongoDB will still be somewhat efficient about the query. But for the most efficiency, you should probably abide by the rules I've just been talking about. Let's talk about kind of an interesting use case of MongoDB indexes and how to index on arbitrary values. Um, I, th I, th I thought this was such a cool example um, and definitely worth sharing. So let's suppose you, you have data that has just arbitrary sets of keys and values, um, but that you want to be able to query on those efficiently. This is a pattern that allows you to do that. Uh, supposing you're indexing on elements of the periodic table, for instance, you want to store their properties. Um, in this case, the sample document that I've inserted has an adders attribute, which points to an array of properties. And each of those properties is defined by a name and a value. That's pretty straightforward. So we have name is weight, value is age, name is density, value is 50. Now, the way we would ensure index, ensure an index on this collection is we would build a compound index on adders.name and adders.value. What this allows us to do is some pretty sophisticated queries. So for instance, the way we would, we would query on this collection is we would use a special query operator on MongoDB, which allows you to match against um, objects that are nested within an array. It's called the elem match operator. And we could easily find all the attributes uh, with a weight greater than 10. And that's what that, that's what that query does at the bottom of the page. So that's kind of an interesting pattern and kind of shows, again, uh, the value of indexing on arrays inside MongoDB documents. Uh, let's talk a little bit about index sizes. I showed you um, a second ago how to determine the size of an index you generally can use this stats method, um, and it'll show, it, it, it's, it's very useful, db.tweets.stats, and we can see uh, the sizes of each individual index, and we can also see the total index size. Now, the reason this is important is because for optimal operation um, of really any database, um, and particularly MongoDB, you want to, at the very minimum, keep your indexes in RAM, and it, it's hard to definitely say whether your indexes are fitting in RAM, but one, 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 one kind of way of measuring this is just simply to look at the total index size, right? In this case, we have about eight megabytes of indexes. Um, so we want our system at least eight megabytes of RAM. Now, we'd actually want a little bit more than that. Generally, to be optimal, you want also your working data set to fit in RAM, or as much of your working data set as possible to fit in RAM. So in this case, let's say we're randomly querying over all the tweets in this collection, and I have about 85 megabytes of tweets. Well, the amount of RAM that I want on my system then, ideally, and this is not necessarily true, but ideally, the amount of RAM I want, especially if I'm using uh, traditional spindle hard drives, is 85 megs plus 8 megs. Um, so what's that, 93 megabytes? Um, if, if I can keep everything in RAM, I can get the best efficiency. But again, at minimum, we want to keep an eye on our index sizes to make sure that they're not growing above RAM. Um, one, one situation that we definitely wouldn't want, and we've certainly seen this, you know, somebody has uh, four gigabytes of indexes, and they just have four gigabytes of RAM, and they have 80 gigabytes of data. That's definitely not going to be optimal because none of the working set of data is really going to fit in RAM. The indexes might, but none of the working set will. So there will be a lot of going to disk. Um, you can also check, there's another helper method, um, total index size, and it kind of gives you a sense of um, your index sizes. So let's talk about kind of querying um, or explaining queries. And this is 
obviously really important to be able to find out how the database is interpreting a particular query. Um, so here we have a sample query. Um, and for any query in the shell, I can specify the query and then tack on the explain method. And what that'll do is that'll return an explain plan for that query. Um, this particular query is using uh, a vtree cursor. And what that means is that it's using an index. And in this case, it's using an index on where uh, x is 1. And I, we'll get a lot of attributes. And I'll show you this um, in practice in just a second on the Twitter collection. But some of the important attributes, n scanned is the number of index entries scanned, n is the number of items returned from the query, and millis is obviously the number of milliseconds the query took to run. Uh, we have another example here um, of a query that's not using an index. And when it's not using an index, what you're going to see is a uh, basic cursor um, as the type of cursor used. Um, you'll generally see a lot more um, uh, entries scanned and um, generally these queries will take a lot longer to execute. Let's just look at this in practice really quickly. Um, you remember we created a, an index on user.friendsCount. So one of the things we can do is we can say db.tweets.find um, and let's just say where user.friendsCount is greater than a thousand. So we kind of want to find popular people. And what we're going to do is we're going to tack on the explain method. And we see kind of what we would expect, which is that um, the query used the index that we built on user.friendsCount. Um, we see the number of objects uh, scanned, the number of milliseconds it took, and then the boundaries of the index that were walked. Um, and in this case, those boundaries started at 1,000 and ended at infinity. Um, if we just change our query just slightly um, to find, for instance, uh, a given value, uh, users.friendsCount with a particular value, we see that the boundaries of the index are 1,000 to 1,000, um, and there are actually two users who have exactly 1,000 friends. We can see that the n returns 2. Um, to take another example, we built, a, we built an index on um, a compound index on screen name and created at. So again, let's take a look. If we do our find one, the user with the screen name here of One of the things we can take a look at here, uh, db.tweets.find, where user.screen name, and in this case, let's just play with a regular expression, it begins with a capital B, dot explain, and one of the things that we'll actually see is that this actually does use that compound index. Because we queried on the first key in the compound index, it was able to use the compound index on screen name and created app. We can see the number of scanned objects and the boundaries, where the boundaries are between B and C. And that's what that regular expression type of query gives us. So running explains on uh, queries and on commonly used queries um, is a really useful way of seeing kind of which, uh, which indexes are used or whether an index is used. Uh, one thing, a couple notes about the query optimizer. Um, a lot of opt query optimizers in relational databases uh, are cost-based. Uh, in other words, they attempt to calculate the cost of the query. Um, with MongoDB, the query optimizer is empirical. What that means is that if you issue a query um, whose query selector could conceivably be used by multiple indexes, then what MongoDB will, will do is it will actually uh, start the query uh, along each of those indexes and try to find out which of the indexes resolves the query the fastest. And the one that wins uh, gets cached, essentially, so that future queries will use the proper indexes. Uh, once a winner is found, once a winning index is found, then um, the other queries that were set off in parallel will be killed off. Um, so this is actually, um, I think this is actually a, a pretty smart way to go about query optimization because it takes into account uh, possibly other factors besides just the, the logical cost of a, of a query. Um, such as a given a given system. Um, and then when you do run explain and you do have multiple possible query plans, you'll see all the different plans that were tried. So explain really will give you quite a bit of information here. Um, one other thing you can do um, is you can uh, specify a hint. Um, obviously this is common with databases being able to tell the database exactly which index I want it to use for the given query. We just specify dot hint. Um, one um, special attribute that we can pass to dot hint 
is the dollar sign natural operator, which um, will scan over the collection in natural order. Um, this is generally used uh, in practice with MongoDB's capped collections, which I spoke about a little bit earlier, uh, which are essentially meant to be read um, in, in order and can be used for certain applications like logging. Um, but generally speaking, you probably won't find yourself using the dollar sign natural operator very frequently. Uh, one other thing I wanted to show is the query profiler. One thing you can do when you're inside the shell is you can actually set a profiling level. So you can say db.setProfilingLevel. Uh, there are a couple levels of granularity, but two is the most granular, meaning that every query um, will actually be logged to a particular collection. And if I show the collections, you can see that we have another special system collection called System.Profile. Um, System.Profile is actually implemented as a capped collection. In other words, it has a fixed size. It's always simply appended to on disk. Uh, it's 128K by default. And so if we run queries on a collection, for instance, the query we just ran, and then we query our System.Profile collection, and uh, we can actually sort it in that natural order I was showing you before. Um, then we should be able to see um, all the recent queries and how long they took, um, how many records were scanned, etc. And this is obviously really useful to run. So it might be something good to run in a development environment uh, while you're kind of taking your application through the rounds. You can query this collection like you would any other collection. So you could say, find me all the queries that took longer than 35 milliseconds. Um, and that would just be a really um, easy way to easy way to use this. And in fact, I can just show you how to do that right now. db.system.profile.find um, where millis is greater than 35. And that would bring up, uh, in this case, just a single entry. So that is actually all that I have. So I wanted to say just a couple things about MongoDB really quickly, and then I'll take questions. Um, most of us are on um, most accessible on the MongoDB user group, which is a Google group. Uh, you can definitely post uh, questions there, and you will generally get answers very quickly. Um, you can try MongoDB with try.mongodb.org. It's a web-based shell, and that will give you access to some of the functions that I showed you just now in the shell. Um, we're actually hiring uh, if, you're very, if you're interested. And we offer support training and advising services for MongoDB. So the thing I'm going to do now is actually um, start taking questions. And I have a list of questions right here. And I'll, I'll start now. So Brad Brewer asks, ensure index also blocks slaves as well, correct? Um, that is correct. So if you, I mean, what will generally happen is you would have a master node and you would have you would have built an index on the master node. And what's going to happen is that that index creation command, which is which is specified as an insert into the system.indexes collection, will be replicated to the slave, and then that will be run on the slave. And then when ensure indexes is run, um, that will block on the slave. This can be a little bit problematic in certain cases if that prevents the slave from doing a lot of writes. So for, for instance, if somebody accidentally fires off a huge index build that takes several hours, um, you would have the possibility of um, having your slave get behind the master, which is kind of a bad situation. So a couple, I guess, takeaways from that would be, one, be very careful about creating indexes. Be very intentional about it. Um, make sure you know what you're doing and make sure you have some sense of how long it will take to build an index. Uh, and two, um, if you are going to build an index that's going to take some amount of time and that's going to be replicated to your slave, then one of the things you'll want to do is um, make sure that your op log is quite large so that it can handle the, the delay. Um, and uh, that's replication is kind of a whole other topic, but those are a couple things to keep in mind if you're familiar with MongoDB's master-slave replication. Uh, the next question from Nizam, can you index fields in a referenced document? Uh, i.e. a DB ref. Yes, um, and I, I, I'm just going to kind of editorialize for just a moment about DB refs. Um, the DB ref is just a convention. It's essentially a sub document that specifies a collection name and some type of unique identifier for a document in another collection. Uh, you don't have to use DB refs. Um, you can simply use a, an ID and store it inside of a, a given document. 
and index on that document. Um, if you do want to use DB refs for some reason, then you can also index on the fields within a DB ref, um, either individually or uh, collectively as a single object, as I showed you um, as I showed you earlier. You probably only want to do that if your DB ref was likely to reference uh, multiple different collections, because uh, otherwise you'd be creating a pretty large index for no reason. The clean machine asks, does it matter which way you sort for indexes? Um, generally, no. Um, the, uh, for instance, if you have just a single key index, then you can do a query that sorts in either direction, and it doesn't matter what direction that index um, is in. If you're, do, if you're doing a sort on a compound index, for instance, on user ID and created at, as I showed in the presentation, then um, you, 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 you want the created at key to sort in the direction that you're most likely to be sorting in. So I, I sorted and created at descending because I figured that would be most, most frequent. But the indexes will, or the queries will be efficient uh, in either case. Clean Machine also asks, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, a follow-up question. I think I believe I answered your follow-up question as well. Uh, Eric asks, how long does the query optimizer typically take to, take to warm up for a collection? Um, I, I, I don't, I mean, it really depends, right? I mean, if you have a lot of index, if you have queries that are, that are frequently, that would frequently match multiple indexes, then you, you, you might see a little bit of warm up time on, on the, on the initial queries, um, on, on those initial queries. But, um, if you don't have that situation, then you, the, the query optimizer won't have really any warm up to do. Um, generally, this isn't an issue in production as far as I've seen. Andre says, is it possible to have more than one compound index with a geo index subpart? Um, yes, it is. But the way, the way geo indexes are, are limited right now is that if you do do a compound index um, using, geo, using the geospatial um, feature, then the, uh, the geospatial index has to be the first in the compound index. Brad Brewer says, why, while the ensure index is running on the master, can I still read from the slaves just stale data? Um, while it's running on the master, yeah, you can certainly read from the slaves, um, and hopefully it won't be too stale depending on what your rights to master look like. Um, then again, if you're running a big, long ensure index on master, you won't be able to write to master at that particular time unless you're running the index in the background. Um, that's kind of what that background option is there for. So if you do happen to be doing a lot of writes to master and you do need to build an index, um, I definitely recommend um, building it in the background so that you can still write to master, um, but do keep in mind that you will um, experience some latency as a result. Diedrich says, question, I have a MongoDB with 100,000 documents and 100,000 subdocuments. Is it faster to build the index once I have finished constructing the database, or should I use ensure index from the start? Well, um, actually, what you should do, if, if the system isn't in production, if you're just loading a bunch of data, um, if you're just loading a bunch of data into the system before actually putting out into production, then it's actually better to build the index after you've inserted the data, because you'll get better compaction. Um, if, you, if you're already running in production, however, I'd recommend ensuring the index in advance so that you can build the index incrementally and not experience any kind of interrupt. Um, now, when, when you say 100,000 documents and 100,000 sub-documents, uh, Diedrich, I'm not quite sure um, how to interpret that. Um, you know, the size of the documents definitely matters. The size of the sub-documents matters. Um, there's definitely a lot of factors there that are, that are hard to deduce from your question, but um, in general, the advice that I just gave should hold. Matt asks, what are your thoughts on creating lots of fixed-sized collections? Um, I'd probably have to know more about the use case, um, so I can't say for sure. Um, if you were, uh, yeah, it, it's, really, it's really hard to, uh, to answer that question. Um, there's nothing wrong with it in, in principle. Jeff asks, any advice on optimizing MapReduce operations where you must iterate on, uh, where you must iterate over every document in a collection? Um, that's actually, that's, 
there, there, there isn't a whole lot you can do actually. I mean, certainly like one kind of minor type of optimization which would be to make sure that, you know, um, you're not going to disk too much when iterating over the collection, but that's probably not a huge factor. You know, one thing you can do with, um, if you're at least not running replica sets, it's not supported in replica sets yet, but it is supported in traditional master-slave replication. It will eventually be supported in replica sets. Is that you can run the MapReduce on a slave exclusively, and that can be a really good way to kind of keep from disrupting the performance of, of a particular node. And that's something that I'd, that I'd probably recommend. Jared asks, why does MongoDB only support one geo index per collection? Do you anticipate this changing in the future? Thanks. Um, I guess I guess I may be like I may be blanking on this. Um, I'm not sure how to answer that question, but um, if you want to follow up with me after the webcast, I'd be happy to answer that for you. Um, you can definitely um, send, a, send a message to mongodb-user and we can get right back to you on that. Eric says, is it possible to have different indexes on the slaves that are on the masters? And if not, is it in the product roadmap? Uh, it's not currently possible right now, but yes, it is definitely on the product road, roadmap. People do ask about that and there are definitely valid use cases for it. One thing that's sort of relevant to this question uh, and that just became available is that with replica sets, one of the options you can specify for the secondaries is that you don't build any indexes. Um, so that can be useful in some situations. Um, that's sort of the first step in allowing um, different indexes on secondaries from primaries. Um, although, of course, in the case of a replica set, you want to make sure that if you did have different indexes on the slave, um, that slave were not able to fill over to master. So you'd want to have a priority zero on that particular secondary, that particular slave, um, because obviously the indexes should be optimized for the production situation and not for any sort of ETL process. Uh, Matt asks a follow-up question. Um, needing 1 million collections with 500 to 1,000 1K sized documents, no indexes. Was that a question about the lots of fixed size collections? Okay. Um, the, 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 just the first thing that the first thing that strikes me about that is um, I think that may not be the most space efficient thing to do, given that each collection does um, introduce a certain amount of overhead. Again, I'd, I'd really have to know more about the use case to to advise on that. Um, Send a message to MongoDB user, and we, we'll get back to you today and kind of advise you on that. All right, so I think that may be all the Q&A. So um, I guess I'm going to turn it back over to Catherine. Um, thank you again for, for attending the webcast and for listening in. And uh, again, you know, post any follow-up questions to MongoDB user. Um, we'll be happy to help you out. Um, we get a lot of questions. We answer a lot of them every single day. So uh, again, thanks a lot for listening. and. Um, and good luck with, with indexing. Hey, thanks, Kyle. That that was very impressive webcast. So I, I think we all got a lot out of it. And, and you did a great job with the questions, too. Thank you so much. I also want to great, thank, thank everyone. You. Oh, you're welcome back any time. by the way, keeps going off. OK. And I will also want to thank everyone who joined us today. It was a great group. I, I really appreciate it when we have a good conversation going there. Excellent question. So thank you, everyone. And as I said, we'll have a recording available in just a couple days. Actually, we're running a bit behind. It'll probably be early next week. So we'll send everyone an email as soon as that's ready. And I believe that we don't have it scheduled yet, but we're hoping to have another MongoDB webcast next month in November. And uh, just watch our website. Uh, O'Reilly.com slash websites for that, or if you're signed up, you'll get an announcement from us. And we hope you'll join us again. So thank you, everyone. I'll uh, talk to you next time. Goodbye.